Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Probably Cancelled podcast. My name is Bridget, and I'm your host, and today I am here with journalist, author, and lecturer, Matthew Errett. And Matthew is the founder of the Canadian Patriot Review, as well as the director at the Rising Tide Foundation and senior fellow of the American University in Moscow. And he's here today to share his knowledge on the history of social engineering in the West and how it all fits into the emerging multipolar world. So thank you so much for being here, Matt, tuning in all the way from Japan. I'm super excited to have you here today. How are you doing? Yeah, thank you for having me on, Bridget. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. I am uh, indeed here in Japan in Fukuoka, uh, which is a little bit in, t- in the south, working on a, a little bit of a project to try to help diffuse some of the tension uh, that's that's tied to the buildup for a, a major war uh, that some idiots out there think is a good idea to uh, uh, deal with the emerging multipolar uh, world order. Um, so that's a, a fun little project. And um Yeah, I think we've got a lot to talk about, so I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. I found your work only recently, about a month ago, and delving into your material and everything that you've covered, everything that you have researched and shared with the public, it's actually pretty astounding how much work you're actually doing on what I consider to be the anti-imperialist front, so I just had to have you on. But could you please tell our our audience who may not know who you are, the work that you do, a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, sure. Well, um, I've, uh, I'm the author of a few books, uh, The Untold History of Canada book series. It's four volumes uh, that I started working on back in 2012. Um, that sort of helped formulate a, a conception of thinking about American North American history um, from a different standpoint um, that I think had a lot of value. So that, that gave me a better sense of what is Canada as far as the idea of, um, of an embedded deep state, which is deeply enmeshed with the city of London, British intelligence, which has always been at the heart of destabilization operations against the United States um, on the part of the higher echelons of British oligarchical controllers. Um, Canada has never been a, its own country. Um, and so the, the thesis sort of went from 1776 to the present and reconstructed Canadian history from the standpoint of seeing Canada not as a sovereign nation, but rather as a geopolitical wedge or a chess piece used to create a wedge between, at different moments in history, the danger of a U.S.-Russia relationship and friendship, which has always been there since 1776. Um, as well as launching assassination operations and other things against uh, various American presidents who did something good to try to give meaning to the U.S. Constitution. So then coming out of that, I did a four-volume series um, of books called The Clash of the Two Americas, published in, also translated in Italian as well as Russian and soon Japanese, Um, but going through a little bit more from a a, a U.S. perspective, what exactly is the the origin of the deep state operation, which people have come to become more familiar with in recent years, again, going back to 1776 and seeing it as an unbroken continuity. Um, As far as what I do beyond just writing those books, um, my wife and I, we started the Rising Tide Foundation, as you pointed out, more to focus on educational, cultural uh, work as a nonprofit based in Montreal, um, focused with the, you know, the, the idea was to try to bring about a conception of a dialogue of civilizations of different cultures so that people in the West would not be so damn ignorant of other cultures in the East, which is, the, I mean, the ignorance that people tend to suffer from in, in the West and Europe and North America is at the heart of a lot of what makes us susceptible to the the corporate um, propaganda, which is trying to weaponize us and get us to acquiesce to a, an emerging war against Russia and China. So the Rising Tide Foundation was designed to try to help in some in some small way uh, that problem. And the Canadian, Canadian Patriot magazine I, I set up in 2012 to sort of provide an economic geopolitical um, um, context to what is shaping Canada and what potential good Canada could offer the world if we changed our paradigm. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are a few of the the hats <clears throat> the hats I wear. You mentioned the senior fellow at the American University in Moscow, which is a bit of a think tank uh, that I work with. For uh, I've been I've been helping out with for about two years. Yeah, that, that, that's a that's a few of the things that I'm that I'm up to. 
those are all super great. It's and also super interesting subject matters, especially the Canada stuff. I mean, you guys still have the queen on your money, don't you? Yeah, it's weird. Eh? Yeah, uh, yeah, we got a queen yeah. on our money. Yeah, that, that's the official head of state <laughs> is the governor general, not not the prime minister. Yeah, I feel like uh, Americans, like USians, don't really quite understand too much about Canada, but especially that fact that it's just really a, an arm of the British. Yeah, it's super interesting to me. And then your your work with Rising Tide is really great as well. So I'm gonna link the website and the Telegram channel for that in the show notes, so everyone can go follow because you guys are putting out really good journalism, really. Uh, but just to get into the subject matter of what we're going to be talking about today, I wanted to talk to you about social engineering. And we know that social engineering and psychological warfare have really been going on for thousands of years, especially in war settings. But I'm particularly interested in the history of social engineering of the past 100 years or so in the West uh, with the advent of psychology, really, as a field Mm -hmm. and the ability to manipulate that in ways that we've never seen before. Uh, Could you give an overview of some of the main mechanisms in which this engineering has been achieved that some of our listeners might not know about? Mm. Yeah, I guess there's there's a few different ways of looking at this. Um, I mean, first of all, there, there's for those who just want a quick mini introduction that that was done in a pretty entertaining way. I highly recommend people just check out Adam Curtis's Century of Self. It's a four part uh, documentary series, somehow published on the BBC back like. 14 years ago or <laughs> yeah. something. Um, that one's so good. It's so good. Yeah, that that that's a good starter as, as, as an opening, uh, as, as an introduction to the field. But um, I think, I mean, there's there's things that the BBC would not allow ever be published, um, which we can talk about, uh, that was not brought up in that in that documentary series. Um, whether or not Adam Curtis, the, the director, was himself um, intentionally deflecting um, attention away from the causal hand of what is behind a lot of the, the social engineering operations that he discusses quite eloquently. I don't know if that was intentional or if he just had blind spots. I don't really know. But he does begin by, by pointing to the, tr- the, the, um, the, more, the more innovative uh, techniques that were discovered to be so successful in the age of World War I um, regarding, you know, basic propaganda in order to sell the American population who was very much not for going into yet another war or any war really at the time America had not really gotten into the habit of getting enmeshed in international warfare. Um, That was always something that George Washington had laid down as a doctrine of the United States that the U.S. is not to be enmeshed in foreign oligarchical manipulated wars. It's something you just can't get out of if you allow yourself to step into it, which was why Washington put so much work in um, organizing a, a culture that would not go get sucked into the bloodbath that the French Revolution was becoming. But he was able to foresee that this was only going to go in a very destructive orientation. You know, uh, John Quincy Adams with the Monroe Doctrine made the same point later on that the, the U.S. is not going to go about looking for monsters to, to destroy. And, uh, and even though many oligarchical oligarchical agencies worked very hard to try to get their stooges and their puppets inside of the United States to sign on to foreign wars. It never really took off. Uh, really, it was only World War I that was the first time we saw this in a major way where the U.S. got pulled in. And that was only at the very end of the war. And only because of what, in hindsight, turned out to be a bit of a false flag in the, the form of the sinking of the, the Lusitania which was a ship that was carrying a, a lot of passengers, but also a lot of weapons, um, which was placed in, a, in an easy to attack position by German U-boats when that went down. Um, and it was, it was really a sacrificial lamb. It was, it was used to try to fuel fire on the flames of, of the mass psyche. But despite that, um, even then the people, the, the masses, did not accept the idea of just going into a major war. So, you know, Edward Bernays, the nephew of of, uh, uh, Sigmund Freud, was put to work uh, in order to come up with a strategy 
to uh, to conduct some mass manipulation of the population, you know, and associate things like democracy with war. You know, if you want to fight for democracy, you should be prepared to go to war, even if it's a war that has no good basis of existence. Because even today, nobody really can say what the cause of World War One even was. Uh, but it worked pretty well. The the techniques, you know, um, that that he used regarding deriving. Um, his his uncle's research into the subconscious into the different um deeper yearnings that are below the conscious level within the mass psyche he was able to to come up with campaigns that that were pretty useful at changing the tide of of popular opinion and they it worked so well that coming out of the war the uh you know bernays and the different networks uh that were very powerful inside of the u.s corporate and media complex were like, well, okay, well, how can we use this in a time for peace? And so that was sort of the, the origins of modern uh, commercial media and, and, you know, the idea of giving people or blurring the line b- between needs and wants so that increasingly people would not know that they didn't need what they were told that they wanted by the different media conditioning that would utilize certain techniques like, uh, you know, deriving phallic uh, imagery from the subconscious when you were trying to sell cigarettes or something like that. Um, but more insidiously, I, I think, and I, well, here, let me, before I say the insidious thing, you know, this, this continued to morph and mutate throughout the 20th century um, in more and more virulent ways that uh, were, were behind the creation of a consumer society. Adam Curtis does go through the... Um, the pop psychology of, you know, that emerged out of Tavistock, um, things like uh, R.D. Lang and other, other uh, pop psychology gurus who um, increasingly, again, thought that it was by tapping into the subconscious forces and just unleashing them that, uh, that we would be able to achieve liberty. But in reality, it just basically made us ever more emotional clowns, not able to utilize our dignity, our, our reason, our conscience, to get control of our immature infantile feeling states that were always kept at odds with our, our thoughts, our, our reasonable component. There was no harmony of the two. Um, so that, that, that created a very, very malleable population. But again, he doesn't really get it. Well, what was behind Tavistock? What was behind MK Ultra? What was behind the social engineers of British intelligence that really made all of this possible? 